a very good morning. It's uh, lovely to be with you here in Larn this Lord's Day. As I was coming down in the car, as my wife was driving me, I was trying to figure out if I had any connections with Larn. And um, I remember meeting you many years ago, too many to mention, in Lisburn. I was a member of Lisburn for a few years. Um, I, and I checked you out on Facebook recently, and I seen Beth Montgomery was doing your children's day. And I know Beth from many moons ago, even longer before I met Yule, when she was at the Faith Mission. My sister was in the Faith Mission, and uh, we lived in Perth at the time, and Beth would come up to our house at the weekend. And I could tell you a few stories about Beth, so I could. But that's about the only thing I could think of. And then I was thinking, actually, we're all the same member of the family of God. Each and every one of us have been adopted into the same family. So we have much in common uh, this morning with each other. We've been saved by the blood of Christ, by the grace of Christ, by the mercy, the wonderful mercy of our God. So we have much to praise him for this morning. And that's what we're going to do with our first hymn this morning. It's a personal favorite of mine. I took this opportunity uh, to pick this. It's praise my soul, the king of heaven. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Now, I don't know, do you stand? You do? That's okay. That's fine. I'm not too sure with all these protocols in place what churches do and what they do and don't do. So that's good to hear that you stand. So let us stand and sing praises to our God. church where everybody's singing 
It's lovely to hear. Let us just come before the Lord at this time and seek his face, seek his help as we come to worship him this morning. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have this morning, your day, the day that you have set aside for us to come to praise and to worship you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that opportunity. And Lord, as we come this morning, we have much to, to praise you for, even in the words of that hymn that we have just sing, sung, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Heavenly Father, if we're saved this morning, that is our testimony. We've been ransomed, healed, restored, and forgiven. All because of the work of our Savior. All because of that precious blood that was shed on Calvary's tree. And Heavenly Father, this morning we come and we give you praise for that. We come and we thank you, Lord, that it pleased you to, to bruise your own Son. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for that because we know without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sin. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who endures forever. We thank you this morning that even in this world that we're in, where it seems to be in turmoil, it seems to be going out of control, the politicians don't know what's happening. They tell us one thing and then do another. But Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the one who is in control of this this earth and this world. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are on the throne. Heavenly Father, you haven't taken time off. This hasn't taken you by surprise. Heavenly Father, you're there and you're in control of all things. And Lord, we praise and we thank you for that this morning. Lord, as we come round your word, Heavenly Father, we would just pray this morning that we will be attentive listeners. That, Heavenly Father, you will take any distractions that we may have, maybe something that's happened in the past week or something that we're thinking and focusing on in the next week to come. Heavenly Father, help us to focus upon you this morning. Upon you, upon your Son. And, Heavenly Father, we pray that as we, as we sing praises to you, as we listen, as we pray, Heavenly Father, what we do glorifies you lifts up your name and exalts our Savior. Heavenly Father, help us this morning. Lord, we know that your word is infallible. It is perfect. And Heavenly Father, we would ask as we come round it, we will delve into it. And Heavenly Father, when we leave this place this morning, after we've heard your word, after your word has penetrated into our hearts, Lord, but we will be different. Heavenly Father, we will be changed. Lord, we don't want to go out the same way as we came in this morning. We want to be more like our Savior. We want to be more like Christ. That is our prayer this morning. Lord, speak to each and every one of us. Lord, we know that we're in different situations in our lives at this time. Circumstances are different from family to family. But Heavenly Father, we would pray that your spirit as it comes into this place, Heavenly Father, will speak into the life of each and every one who is here. It will comfort those who need to be comforted. It will strengthen those who need to be strengthened. Heavenly Father, you will will be a fortress to those who need to hide in that fortress. And Lord, those who need to be chastised, those who need to be convicted, Heavenly Father, again, we pray that your spirit and your word will do that this morning as well. So, Lord, as we come around your word, Lord, we would come as well knowing that so often we come with stained hands. And, Lord, this morning we asked if there is any sin in our lives, any secret sin, any forgotten sin. Heavenly Father, we come individually and corporately this morning to ask for forgiveness. We pray all these things in our precious Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Well, at this point, we have the children's talk, or the young at heart's talk, because I know fine, really, some of you older ones love this bit as well, so you do. And actually, I'm not really good at children's talks. I I don't really like doing them. But uh, you'll ask me, and I said, okay, I'll do it. 
And I actually practiced this last week in my own church, so I did. And don't ask my wife, but it didn't go well, so it didn't. Okay, so hopefully the children who are here will like this and the young at heart will like this as well. But I'm going to ask you a question this morning. What happens if you don't look after your eyes? What happens if you don't look after your eyes? Well, one thing is obviously we start to wear these things, don't we, sometimes? Glasses. And sometimes what can happen, we can put on the wrong shoes, maybe put on an odd pair of socks, we can walk into the wrong shop. There's lots of things we can do if we don't look after our eyes because our, our eyes help us so much. But you know what? Sometimes our eyes also deceive us. Our eyes tell us lies. Now, you may say, Joe, well, that's not right. I, I, my eyes don't deceive me. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can deceive you this morning. Maybe I shouldn't be doing that in church, should I? Deceiving you. But I want you to see something. Now, I want you to look very carefully, especially the children who are here. I want you to look very carefully at this. Okay? Now, can you see this happening? Did you see that? No? No? Okay. Right. Did you see it? No, maybe you hasn't paid the electric bill, I don't know. Let me see here. I'll try it again, okay. Did you see that? You see that? You did it? Okay, now we'll see you again. Oh, 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 there it is again. Eh? But you know what you've seen wasn't real. Because what this happens, and you do that, and it comes out the other side. But that's not what you really saw. It's not really what happened. The other thing, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself now. I love puzzles. I love puzzles. Not the Sudoku or, you know, crossword puzzles, because I'm, no, I'm not intellectual enough to do those. I'm not that good. But I love, you know, puzzles with your hands. And I love the Rubik's Cube. And I remember when the Rubik's Cube came out in the early 80s, probably 1980, my friend got one. My friend was able to do it within about a week. And that really annoyed me, so it did. And I've tried ever since to do it on my own without any help, my nephew in, Northern, uh, in Scotland has a wee app on his phone that helps him do his Rubik's Cube. But I don't want that. I want to learn how to do it properly. And I, and I can't do it. But I bought a book. And this book told me I'll, I can actually be able to do it by the time I've finished this book. But when it came in, you know, do you know what happened? I don't know if you'll be able to see this, because normally I'd like to be down at the front. But see if you can see that. There's nothing in it. It's just an empty book. There's no, there's no instructions. No nothing. Isn't that amazing? But then if you look again, oh, wait a minute, there is stuff in it. There is stuff. You see that? Black and white. I thought, that's no good. I'd rather have some colour. But if you do it again, you'll see it's all colour. Isn't that amazing? But you know, the thing is, your eyes are deceiving you. They're telling you lies because there's nothing there. There really isn't anything there. But you see how easy your eyes can be deceived. And the other thing that our eyes can do is, what we can do is we can look at the outside of people. And we see someone with a nice shirt and tie on. And their hair's nice. And they're shaved. And we think, oh, they're a nice person. We look at someone who's next to them. And they've got maybe an old pair of jeans on. And their, their hair's unkept. And maybe they haven't shaved for a few days. And they might be a wee bit smelly because they haven't had a chance to put some aftershave on. And we think, well, that person's not that good. But you know what? That's the wrong thing to think. Because what's so important is actually what's inside. That's what's important. Not what everybody else sees. And you know, Scripture tells us, we're going to look this morning at um, David. And you can see that up there this morning. Samuel went to pick David. And, and, and look what the Lord says to him. Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees the outward for the Lord man looks on the outward but on the outward appearance but the Lord looks on the heart and that's what's so important is the heart what your heart condition is now I have another one one more thing because everybody thinks they're good don't they Everybody thinks, if you were to ask anybody, children, if you ask your mum and dad, are they good? They'll say, yes, we're good. If we ask anybody here this morning, we were to take a wee, a wee test, everybody would say, I'm good. I, I don't do anything bad, I'm good. Well, I have a wee test here that tells you if you're good or bad, if your heart's good or if it's bad. Now, the only thing is, 
Okay? This is where it goes wrong a little bit. I have this in English, but I've lost it. So I had to buy it again, and it came in Spanish. So it did. But the good thing is we have a Spanish-speaking man in our church in, in Scotland, so he was able to interpret it. And what it is is, are you a good person test? And C means yes, I'm a good person. And no obviously means no. No is the same in Spanish as well. But everybody thinks they're good. Everybody thinks they have a good heart, don't they? And who do you think is the best person in this, this church this morning? Apart from myself, obviously. I would say it was my wife. Okay? So I'm going to test my wife. Do you mind coming up? Is it okay that they come up? That's yeah, okay. Now she's going to be honest and try and point to see what she thinks she is. Do you, are you a good person? I'm definitely a good person. You tell me that all the time. You tell me that all the time. So, C, yes, no, obviously no. So, okay. No, you're not. Failed. You see, no one is good. No one's heart is good. In Jeremiah, it says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Who can understand it? Now, there was only one person who lived on this earth who was good, perfectly good, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came, he lived a perfect life. He didn't say anything bad. He didn't tell any lies. He never thought anything bad. He was perfect, and he needed to be perfect. Because he was going to go to the cross one day to take upon himself our sin because we are not perfect. There needed to be someone perfect to do that. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we have to remember this morning, boys and girls, and young at heart, is that it's not the outward appearance that's important. It's the inward that is so important. The heart. Is your heart right? And we have to honestly answer that and say it's not. And there's only one way to get our heart right. And we find that in 1 John, chapter 1 and verse 9, where it says, what's the wrong one up, but anyway, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we confess them, if we come before the Lord, he is faithful to forgive our sins and he will cleanse us from some unrighteousness, a little bit of unrighteousness, no. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's what we have to learn this morning. Is it's not what we see on the outward. It's what's in inside. In man's heart, in boys' and girls' hearts, and women's hearts. That's what's most important. And the Lord Jesus Christ has made us a way that we can stand before God one day. And he will see us in the righteousness in Christ. And our hearts will be pure. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for those warm words of welcome. Um, it is a busman's holiday. I'm actually on holiday at the moment. Um, I'm over visiting my mother. This is the other lady beside my wife and my father as well. My father isn't able to be with us this morning. Um, I, told, I, I came late into the ministry. Uh, I was called late into the ministry. I'm a 55, and I know underneath those masks, you're all going, wow, I don't believe that for a moment. But I am, I'm 55, and I, I've told my own folks at church, you know, that um, I probably have one church, or at the very most, two churches in me before I retire, before the Lord takes me home. And so I take every opportunity I can to preach, um, whether I'm in holiday or whatever it is. If I get asked to preach, I will preach. Because as I said, the Lord's called me late into the ministry, and he's done that for a reason, uh, because, probably because of my life experiences that I've had through my life. But I will take every opportunity I can to praise him, worship him, and preach his wonderful gospel. Um, so it is a pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. It's not a chore at all, let me tell you that. And we're going to sing another hymn to our God this morning, and it is Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. Again, standing to sing as we praise our wonderful King.
If you can turn with me in your Bibles, or switch them on, or look over my shoulder, or somewhere. And we're going to read from God's Word this morning in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel and chapter 6. 2 Samuel and chapter 6. We'll take time to read the first 10 verses. This is the word of the Lord. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Beli Judah to bring up from there the ark of of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill. And Uzzah and Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ohio went before the ark. And David... And all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Achon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Pera Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. We'll end our reading there at verse number 10. Let us just come before the Lord this morning in prayer before we come round his inspired and fallible word. Let us pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, heavenly Father, that it is inspired. It is infallible. It is inerrant. It is all-sufficient. And heavenly Father, as we come this morning to look at it, Lord, we ask for the Spirit's help. For Lord, this is no ordinary book. And we understand that. And we need the Spirit of God to illuminate the pages that are in front of us. So Heavenly Father, we ask for that. As we come to study, to see it illustrated, to see it applied into our hearts. Lord, we need the Spirit of God to do that. Lord, open up our eyes that we may see what you would have us to see. Open up our hearts, Heavenly Father, that you will show us what we have to do. And open up our minds, Lord, that we may understand what you would have us to do. So, Lord, again, we just pray for the Spirit to be in this place, to help each and every one of us as we come to your wonderful word. Amen. 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 I think it's important to have a little bit of context when it comes a little bit of background to this portion of Scripture. In 1 Samuel, we see that the ark of the Lord has been lost. Israel had went out to battle against the Philistines. Israel were encamped in Ebenezer. The Philistines were in that place called Aphek. And they went head to head in battle. And Israel suffered a defeat that day. We read in the Scriptures that they lost some 4,000 men in that battle on the battlefield. And as they come back into the camp, literally with their tails between their legs, the elders of Israel, and this tells us something, for two reasons, this tells us something. The, The elders of Israel come back and they say, why has the Lord defeated us this day, today, before the Philistines? Why has he done this? In one way it shows us, and this is a positive way, that these elders understand that the battle is always the Lord's. And that's what we have to understand this morning. No matter what battle that we go through, no matter what trial, whatever circumstance that we find ourselves in, the battle is the Lord's. It is His. 
In fact, it's mentioned later on as David is coming before Goliath, where it says the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into my hands. So the battle is always the Lord. So that's a good thing that these elders understood. But there's another thing, another telling thing, and this is a negative thing. They asked a question, which is a good thing, but they didn't wait for an answer. They didn't go and seek or wait upon the Lord for that answer. They looked to themselves to find out what to do. For they said, let us, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. What they're saying is, we'll bring this Ark of the Covenant to the people. We'll bring it into the midst of the battle. That's what we'll do. And when we bring it in, that'll save us. That's going to help us in this battle. The elders were looking at the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord as a a lucky charm. It was a four-leaf clover almost to them at this point. So this one act, this one statement, truly portrays these elders for what they really are, for who they really were. Foolish men. Fooling themselves, looking to themselves, deceiving themselves, seeking their own counsel and not the counsel of the Lord. But they go ahead. And the ark is brought into the camp. And there's a mighty shout. There's a great loud noise. The earth itself resounded with the noise of this shout. The earth shook. The Philistines heard it. And they were afraid. For they said, our God has come into the camp. Not the God, our God. For remember, they worship many deities, these Philistines. And we'll be introduced to one very shortly. But they were still fearful. They were still fearful. For they said, how can we be delivered from this God? A God who struck down the Egyptians with the plagues. So they knew of this God, the God of Israel. They knew of him. But yet they still take courage. They say, take courage. We don't want to become slaves of these Hebrews. So we're going to go back and fight again. They go back into into battle and they fought Israel once more. And this time the, the Philistines have an even bigger victory. In fact, they humiliate Israel. And even though it says that many fled the battle, still 30,000 foot soldiers died that day, were killed at the hands of the Philistines. And the ark of God is captured at this point. It's a real bad day for the nation of Israel. But what a victory, what a great trophy for the Philistines to have. They have the centerpiece of their enemy's worship. They've captured that. So as the Philistines have this great trophy, they bring it from Ebenezer to Ashdod and they put the Ark of God into their house of their God, their deity, Dagon. Dagon was their chief idol, their chief deity. It's said that Dagon was a a father of Baal, the father of Baal. And he's shown, or there's pictures of him as half man and half fish. Now, they may have thought as they brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord into the house of their pagan god, that their pagan god was looking down upon the god of the nation of Israel, the true and living god. In a way, he was a prisoner to their god, Dagon, because he was looking down. Their pagan deity was superior to the god of Israel. But we must remember that the Ark of God is not an idol, never was an idol. But here, it's been treated as one. And no doubt the people of, of Ashdod are having, they have a good feeling about this. They have a good feeling about themselves. They're happy with what's happened. They've just had this great victory. They've captured the precious possession of the enemy. And now it lays at the feet of, the, of their deity, of their God. But the next day they rose early. They went to the house of their God. And the sight that greeted them was one that they did not expect. For their God was flat on his face. He was fallen down flat on his face, before the ark of the Lord, before the ark of God. Listen, God does not share his glory. He will not share his glory. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Now I'm sure they did what they could do. They, they put their fallen idol back in its place, back up against the wall or whatever it was or in the center of this meeting house. But the next day, worse was to greet them. For they went back and again, once more, the idol was fallen down, flat in the face. But this time, his hands were cut off, his head was cut off, severed from the main trunk of his body. 
And the people of Ashdod saw this and they were terrified. But not just that. They weren't just terrified. They were afflicted with tumors and sores. And they knew that the ark and the God of the ark was their real issue. They knew that. So they wanted to get rid of it. And they brought it to Gath. Lucky old Gath, eh? But they brought it to Gath. But even as it's sitting in Gath, the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord's anger was against that city, causing great panic in that city. And again, afflicting, afflicting many of the men in that city with tumors and sores. And once more, the people had enough. They didn't, want have, they didn't want this. So they wanted to get rid of the Ark again. So they sent it to another town called Ekron. And Ekron, when, as soon as they saw it come into their being, into their city, they knew what happened in these other cities. And again, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. They wanted to get rid of it. It had to go. And there was a panic, a deathly panic throughout the whole city. And the men who did not die in that panic again were struck down with sores and tremors, or uh, tumors. Eventually, the ark, this is to cut a long story short, eventually the ark was returned to Israel in a place called, or the house of a man called Abinadab. And it stayed there for some 20 years. And that's where we are in the story now. David wants to go and get the ark of the Lord. But what I just said is something that we must not look over or just skim over. The ark of the covenant of the Lord was returned to Israel and it stayed in the house of Abinadab for 20 years. 20 years. No longer does it seem to hold any kind of prominence in the religion of the nation. It seems to be cast aside, as it were. Saul had been made king in this time. Did he go and look for the ark to bring it back to the center of the nation, to be the center of the nation's religion and praise and worship? No, he didn't. It's only David that does that. It seems to be upon David's heart. It's a burden upon David's heart to go and get the heart of the covenant and to build a temple for the Lord. Now, we know that David didn't get that chance to build a temple. But it's a time he wanted to go and get the Ark of the Covenant to bring it back to Jerusalem where it belonged. And the first thing I want you to look at this morning is David's motives were right, but his mode was all wrong. His motive was right, but his mode was all wrong. We read that David gathers 30,000 men and they all go to get the Ark of the Covenant. And remember, the Ark of the Covenant was a place where God's presence dwelt here on this earth. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was seen as the very throne of God here on this earth. That's how important the Ark of the Covenant was to the nation. And David understands this. He, he knows this. And he wanted to go and get it back and to bring it back to where it should be. Now, if we didn't hear any more of the story at this point, we would say, well, well done, David, wouldn't we? We'd say, well done. What you're doing, you're doing the right thing. We'd probably praise him, probably come along, pat him on the back and say, well done. You've shown some great leadership here, David, doing what you want to do. But look what he does. And what he does next is all wrong. Verse 3. Verse 3. And it says this. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill. As I said, this is all wrong. This is the ark of God. And God is very detailed how it was to be built and how the nation were to treat the ark. He was very specific with this. Basically, he says, don't look and don't touch. He also told them how the ark of the Lord was to be carried. God is very specific in the way it was to be moved. And, this, and David disobeyed the Lord. He wanted to move the ark to Jerusalem. As I said, his motives were right. Absolutely. But the way he went about it was all wrong. And if he stopped for a moment, he would have realized that. But he was just like the elders. He didn't seek the Lord. He didn't go to the scriptures. For if he had, he would have known that the ark was always to be carried, or to be carried, never transported on any kind of vehicle. Whether it was a, a donkey or a cart, an old cart or a new cart, anything. It was always to be carried on the shoulders using gold-covered wooden poles. Always. The Ark of the Covenant was, was to be transported this way, and this was the only way, not by a new cart. This is what it says in Exodus chapter 25. 
And you shall make poles of Achaia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. But what David did was actually treat the ark of the covenant of the Lord the exact same way the Philistines did. Now you you may say to me, well, what do you mean, Joe? Well, David puts the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord onto this new cart, throws it onto the back of this new cart to, to, to transport it. That's exactly the same way the Philistines did as they tried to get rid of the Ark of the God of God. In 1 Samuel 6, uh, chapter 6, it says this, they prepared a new cart to take the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. He was doing the exact same thing as the Philistines did, treating the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord the same way the Philistines did, as a normal object. The Philistines, again, just threw it on the back of a cart. That was it. Now, I understand it did not matter if this was an old cart. It didn't matter if it was a new cart. It it could have been a gold-plated cart. It could have been studded with precious stones. that, That didn't matter. Its appearance didn't matter. For the mode of transport is, is all wrong. All wrong. Contrary to the word of God. God had spelled out in his word how the Ark of the Covenant was to be transported. And David was disobedient to the word of God. And before we move on, as you read that particular portion of scripture, you may notice something, that the house of Abinadab was actually on a hill. So was it easier? Did David take the easy option to go and get the ark and, and, and just put it on a cart rather than bring it down the hill upon the shoulders of those of the tribe of Levi who were told to carry it? But again, we must understand something. It doesn't matter how hard that job would have been, that journey would have been for them. There was only one way that the ark was to be moved, the way God ordained it. But David thought he knew better. He thought he knew better. And so often today, as we look at church, we think, you know, we will give the Lord a helping hand. The Lord has told us how to to worship him. But, you know, many times we think we know better, don't we? Sure, I'll give the Lord a helping hand here. That's what he needs. Listen, God's word tells us, when God's word tells us to do something, we are to do it the way he has prescribed it to be done. Not the way the world will like it to be done. We do not copy what the world does. We do not copy what the way the world does the world does things to make our life easier. We don't employ the tactics of the business world or what any kind of world we live in to fill our pews in our churches. Many people do that today. They want to attract worldly men and women and children into their pews by using worldly programs, worldly services. But you know, once we go down that road and when we start to teach them the truth, teach them that they're all sinners in the eyes of a holy God, tell them that hell is real and that their sin will take them there to God's hell. When we tell them they need to repent and they need to turn to Christ in faith. Listen, they'll be up out of their seats and through that door quicker than you can say Rubik's Cube. They don't want to hear that. We need to be set apart as a people, as a church. People need to look upon us. They they need to see a difference in us. We're not to be the same as the Philistines. We're not to be the same as this world. I'm not saying we're better than them. For we were once like them, weren't we? We were also sinners. But by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, by the power and the convicting power of the Spirit of God, we came to a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Here David's motivation was right. But the way he went about it was all wrong. But that's a lesson we have to learn today. Especially when we evangelize. Especially when we worship. Especially when we do church. We must do it the way God has told us to do it. Not the way we think we should do it. 
God, or the church is here to glorify God, not man, not a denomination. It is here not to entertain. It is here to glorify God. Next we see the party and the purity. You know, if anybody knows John Brand, he'll as alliteration. So you'll, you'll understand why I've got so many alliterations. But the party and the purity. Look at verse 5 with me. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and with lyres and with harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. David and the people were happy here. They're in party mode. They're celebrating. And why not? Why not? <clears throat> they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord back to where it should be, back into the middle of the people, back into Jerusalem itself, back into the, the nation's worship, into the nation's religion. So there's a party going on. They're singing. There's musical instruments are being played. They're joyous, and they're making that joy known. And remember, there's about 30,000 of them doing this, probably more. So there, there must have been some religi religious racket going on at this particular moment in time as they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant along. But as the possession is going along, celebrating, all of a sudden it goes quiet. It stops. Everything stops. There's a deadly silence. For up ahead they see Yuza. He's on the ground. Why is he there? What's happened? As the cart and as the ark travels along the road, they had a problem on the road. As they come to the threshing floor of Akon, now remember this road that they're on would have been well worn, probably full of many ruts, many potholes, for many other carts would have been on that road before them, bringing or delivering grain to the threshing floor. And as this new cart goes along, moves along this road, it runs into trouble, probably hits a pothole. The oxen begin to stumble, the cart bounces, and it looks as if the ark of the covenant of the Lord is about to fall off this new cart. And let us be honest at this point. What Uzzah does, I'm sure most of us would have done as well. He puts out his hand, but he, he just doesn't touch the ark. He takes hold of the ark to stop it from falling to the ground. That, that's, that's an almost natural, instinctive reaction, isn't it? To do something, to stop it from falling. He puts his hands upon the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, thinking that he's going to steady it. He's helping it. He's going to protect it. It looks unstable to him. So this is what he must do. This is the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, so I have to save it. But let us remember, no one, no one is allowed to touch the Ark. Not even those who are from the tribe of Levi who are carrying it on their shoulders, on those wooden poles, gold-covered wooden poles. For they were told earlier on, touch the ark and you will die. For you see, the ark at this point as well should have been covered. It was to be covered by skins. And this was teaching the people of God the holiness of God. The ark of the covenant of God was not to be handled in a haphazard way. It was to be handled with the utmost reverence. They would approach it with fear and with awe. But, this new, but the ark was on this new cart. And it was uncovered. It was exposed. But also, excuse me. I want you to remember something. This cart, or sorry, this ark of the covenant of the Lord has been in Uzzah's house for some 20 years. He's the son of Abinadab. So it's been in his house for some 20 years. Quite possibly when it arrived at first, there was awe. There maybe was reverence. There maybe was fear for what was in their house. But maybe as they began to walk past it every day, as, as, as they saw it every day, it just became an everyday object to them. Just another piece of fancy furniture in their home. He was used to it. It was nothing special. So possibly Uzzah thought nothing of touching it. The holy in his eyes, the thing that was holy, had become the ordinary. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against him, and he died. He died. Now, when you read that, be honest with me, when you read that, how does that make you feel? I know that what we're supposed to say, I understand that, but how does that truly make you feel? Does it seem unfair? Does it seem a bit harsh? And 
in today's world it does. It, it seems too severe to them. They think that, well, he's, he was doing it for the right reason. He, does what, he doesn't want to see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord fall to the ground. Surely touching it, holding on to it, was helping it. What harm could that really have done? Jonathan Edwards, when he was preaching on this particular portion of Scripture, and I paraphrase because I couldn't find the, the exact quote or the exact sermon, but he says something along these lines. It's incredible to think that Uzzah thought that his hands were cleaner than the dirt or cleaner than the dust that the cart or that the Ark of the Covenant would fall into. For Uzzah's hands were defiled with sin and they were touching what was holy. Listen, God knew Uzzah's heart. To us, this touch looks trivial. To the world, the punishment is over the top. It's harsh. And it proves to them that there, if there is a God at all, he's not a loving God. But this was disobedience. This was contempt for God. Disdain for his holiness. Something very similar happened in the New Testament in the book of Acts with Ananias and Sapphira. They kept back a little bit of money, didn't they? Just a little bit, that's all. They gave the majority of the church to the work of the Lord. The vast majority was given to the disciples. What harm would that do? It wasn't that much. But again, they lied to the Holy Spirit. They were disobedient to God. They held God in contempt. They mocked him by their actions. Listen, God is just in all his ways. He is righteous. He is just. That is his character. If he wasn't just, if he wasn't righteous, if he wasn't holy, then he would not be God. Psalm 89 says this, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. You know, this can be a problem today. Man, women want God on their own terms. They want God who is a a little bit righteous. They want a God who is just a little bit just, just a little bit holy. Just a little bit. They want a God who is of their, own make of, of their own making. One who is palatable and one who is marketable. A God who is just holy enough to deal with really bad people. But not holy enough, not just enough, not righteous enough to deal with them. Just the bad people out there. They want a God who they can manipulate to suit themselves and their behavior. And that's what's happening out in the world today, if they believe in God at all. As we read this passage of Scripture, we may struggle to see the issue. But we know that God, as he did what he did, was justified. He was correct. He was righteous. For Uzzah was struck down dead by the glory of God's holiness. And yet, we may still struggle with what we have in front of us. But let me say this. We are to come before God with a holy fear. And let me tell you, that's lacking in the world today and unfortunately it's lacking in the church today. God is holy. He cannot look upon sin. He's set apart from his creation. God is light and there's no darkness in him. He is holy. He is pure. Listen, I know the attributes of God are all the same. They're as, they're as important as each other. I understand that. But listen, God is love because he is holy. God is merciful because he is holy. God is righteous because he is holy. He is jealous because he is holy. He is full of wrath because he is holy. His ways are perfect because he is holy. He is full of beauty because he is holy. He's full of wisdom because he is holy. He is full of knowledge because he is holy. Do you see what I'm trying to tell you this morning? God is holy. We must learn that lesson. And there's a, there is a right way and a wrong way to come before this holy God. As a Christian, if you're a Christian this morning, we're to come before him in awe, in wonderment, in reverence, in fear. A holy fear for who he is and what he has done. 
saving us from our sins, from the consequences of our sin, saving us from an eternal hell. Now, I don't know any of you is here this morning. So you may be unsaved this morning. And if you're unsaved this morning, the only way you can come to God is through Christ. Through Christ alone. Not through your parents. Not through a membership of this church. Not through your pastor. But through Christ and him alone. Scripture tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Today, when we think of a mediator, we think of someone who stands between two rival parties, two warring factions to reconcile them together. And Scripture tells us, if you're unsaved this morning, that you're in enmity with God. In other words, you hate God. You're in revolt revolt of God. You're in disobedience. You live your life in disobedience towards God. If you're not saved today, the wrath of God is upon you. It is upon you. And you need to be reconciled with God. You need a mediator. And that mediator is Christ. Christ came to this world and he took him upon himself human nature, still fully God, still fully human. And he willingly submitted himself to his father, to the will of his father and demands of God's law. Christ can be your mediator this morning. Through faith, you can be justified and have peace with God through the finished work of Christ. If you, return, if you repent of your sins and turn to him in faith. Very quickly, what we see is David's anger, and this will be very quickly. What we see next is David's anger. He's angry with the Lord. He's angry with, God, with God's judgment upon Uzzah. Verse 8 says, And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. But the truth is, the only person that David should have been angry with at this point was with himself. God was disobedient to the commands of God. Yes, I, I believe he should have went for the ark. But he should not have brought it along on a new cart uncovered. The holy had become ordinary again. And he's probably thinking like we're all thinking, you know what, Uzzah meant well, Lord. But again, I want you to know something about this verse. Verse, it says this, that the Lord broke out against Uzzah, which means to breach, to break through. And this was to a friend and certainly to someone who actually David knew. And if you were to look back, if we had time, we could look back in the previous chapter. The same word is used when God gives David victory over his enemies. It says in verse 20 of chapter 5, And the Lord has broken through mine enemies before me like a breaking flood. God's perfect holiness will judge David's friends as well as his foes. For his perfect holiness will judge the Jew, the Gentile, the sinner, the saved, the saved, the unsaved, me or you. If you're disobedient to God, if you're unsaved and you mock God, deride the things of God, and understand this please this morning, you can mock God and the things of God by hearing the gospel week in and week out and doing nothing about it. By doing nothing, in fact, you're rejecting the message of the gospel. And by rejecting it, you are mocking Christ and all that he has done for you. Is that you this morning? You could be saved this morning. And you could be living in disobedience to God, living in, in your secret sin. Sin that you think no one else sees. But God does. And God will judge. Because he is holy. Do not mock God. Do not play with God. God is real this morning. God is holy this morning. As I said earlier on, man likes, to, likes a God that they, they have in their head. That he's, he's warm and he's fuzzy and he's a mate. He's a bit of a laugh and he turns a blind eye to those certain things that you do. He's not that kind of God. If that's your idea of God this morning, you need to forget that. For the God that we face today, the God that we will all have to stand before on Judgment Day, is a God who is holy, absolutely a God of love, absolutely a God full of grace and mercy, absolutely. 
but also a God who is just, righteous, and holy. David started off with good intentions. He knew that the Ark of the Covenant was precious and important to the people of Israel. He wanted to bring it back to Jerusalem to be once more the center of the nation's worship. But he went about it the wrong way, all wrong. David knew God. David knew the law of God. But he decided to do what he wanted to do, the way he wanted to do it. As one commentator says, he decided to serve God in his own terms. You cannot do that. I cannot do that. None of us can do that this morning. Let us learn a lesson from David this morning. God's word is sufficient. Let us be obedient to God's word this morning. Let us not look into the words of God and try and add to it or try and subtract it to just to make our life easier or just to try and fill the pews of our church. We cannot improve the words of God. If you're unsafe this morning, do not ignore the word of God. It's not like any other book. It's a, it's a book that will change your life. It will convict you. It will transform you. Do not ignore the word of God. It says this, and I'll leave you with this verse. You all know it. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Do not ignore the word of God this morning. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you for your word. And Heavenly Father, we know that it is all sufficient. Heavenly Father, we know that so often as we read the, the words in that, the pages of, of sacred scripture, we can see ourselves in it. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can also see our redemption in it. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we read your word, we can be strengthened, we can be comforted. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that this morning, as your word has went forth, Lord, it will not return to you void. It will accomplish what it's set out to do. And Lord, it may comfort. Heavenly Father, it may strengthen, but it may convict. It may even harden some hearts, Lord. But Lord, this morning we pray if, if there's anybody in this building who's, who does not know Christ as our Savior, or anybody who's listening or, or watching on Facebook, Lord, if there's someone who does not know Christ as their Savior. Lord, we would pray this morning that they will not ignore the words of your word. Heavenly Father, that they will delve deep into Scripture, that they will, they will see the truth of Scripture, that they are a sinner and they need to be reconciled with God. Lord, we pray that the Spirit will work in their lives, will convict them of their sin, show them their need of Christ as their Savior. That is our prayer. And again, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning in this building who does not know Christ as their Savior, Lord, speak to them. Turn that, that heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Again, Lord, we thank you for your help this morning. We thank you for your presence. And Lord, we would ask that as we leave this place, we leave it quietly and prayerfully. In the name of our Savior, amen.